Rise Son of Rome has always been a game I remember quite fondly, which if you have a peek at the game's Metacritic or reviews back in 2013, may surprise you. I know it surprised me when I played the game a year later, when I finally picked up the Xbox One for myself. Now, I'm going to be honest about my own bias here. I love history. It's actually one of the few subjects I still actively seek out learning more about to this day, and makes me actually want to read a book. Or at least, open up Audible. Same thing. I love it all, whether it be ancient or recent history, world conflicts, art, religion, culture, civilization, the list goes on. But ancient Rome in particular is a period in history that I find endless fascination with. And so, when my love for history meets my love for gaming, especially in regards to Rome, I can't help but forgive a game's issues because I just enjoy being able to experience this period in time. But six years is a long time between playthroughs. I'm sitting here a little jealous about everyone playing the PS5 and the Xbox Series X, and so I wanted to revisit another launch title to ease my sadness. So is Rise Son of Rome as good as I remember? Maybe even an underappreciated title? Or are the initial reviews in fact correct? And Rise is a bit of a meh affair and just a game to showcase the power of next generation. Let's find out. Rise Son of Rome had quite the journey from concept to release, a seven year long journey in fact. Ideas for Rise originally began back in 2006, with Crytek CEO eager to expand the studio to allow for work on multiple titles at once, after the studio's success with the original Far Cry. Rise originally began as a project called Kingdoms, which was a first person role playing game set in a fantasy medieval universe and was to be paired with another title named Kings, set in the same universe but changing genres into an MMO RPG. Crytek pitched both titles to multiple publishers with no real interest occurring until 2009 when Crytek met with Microsoft. Despite Kingdoms not being a functional title at the time, only serving as a proof of concept, Microsoft admitted their lack of first person melee combat games for the Xbox 360 and decided to publish Kingdoms. Kings ended up being rejected and subsequently dropped by Crytek to focus on Kingdoms, which Microsoft and Crytek had agreed was a great fit for Microsoft's yet to be released Kinect. At E3 2010, codename Kingdoms was revealed to the public, but in early 2011, the game's direction shifted. Instead of building a medieval fantasy world, the decision was made to instead build a realistic ancient Rome. This shift led to Rise being revealed at E3 2011 as a connect only title, but Crytek used this announcement to test the waters on the public's perception of the Kinect more than anything. It didn't take long after this reveal though for Crytek to begin worrying that if Rise only used the Kinect that it could be too tiring for players or that the Kinect may not detect movements accurately and end up being a frustrating time. This led to three different prototypes for Rise being developed. One all out Kinect title, another with Kinect features but primarily using the controller and another with no Kinect features at all. This experimenting helped Crytek land on including the Kinect through voice commands and gestures, but primarily using the controller and changed the perspective from first to third person. 2012 was a year of silence from Rise, but finally after seven years of development, the newly titled Rise Son of Rome was revealed with actual gameplay this time at E3 2013 and now releasing as a launch title for the Xbox One. 
Rise Son of Rome released in November 2013, but as I've stated in the introduction, wasn't received particularly well, apart from the consistent praise for the visuals. And to Crytek's dismay, Rise didn't sell well either. When I look at Rise Son of Rome's development, all I can really think of is, this was a little bit of a mess. The constant changes in direction to me suggest Rise could have used a little more time in the oven to flesh out some concepts a little more because despite the game being in development for 7 years, really only 2 of them were focused on Rise. But even with the average reception, Rise wasn't even safe from controversy as an investigation by the Federal Trade Commission uncovered an undisclosed paid endorsement deal between Microsoft and Machinima. Microsoft paying Machinima to not portray Microsoft, the Xbox One, or the launch titles in a negative manner, paying between $15,000 and $30,000 for positive reviews for Rise specifically. What a mess. Honestly, there's no other word for it. But despite this mess of a development, back in 2014, I really did enjoy this game. So how does it hold up today? Rise Son of Rome is set in an alternate version of Rome as the game begins amidst a battle. We are quickly introduced to our protagonist, Marius Titus, as we lead a defense of Rome against Celtic barbarians. Marius hands a sack of unknown contents to a subordinate and commands him to display its contents in an easy to see position, as once the barbarians see it, they will disband. Marius fights his way to secure the Roman Emperor, Nero, who is petrified that the myth of Damocles is in fact real and has come to kill him. Marius manages to get the Emperor to a private safe room, and at the Emperor's command, Marius begins to tell his story. The rest of the game is in essence an extended flashback that depicts the events that have led Marius to this point. Marius' story begins just as he has successfully completed his training to become a soldier, and is about to leave Rome to serve at a peaceful post in Alexandria. Before his deployment though, he returns home to visit his family as we meet his father Leontius, a former general and current member of the Roman Senate. It's through our conversations with our father where we learn of the tale of Damocles, which after hearing should immediately make us suspicious of the Emperor, as essentially Damocles is a tale for commanders and leaders to look after their men or have Damocles rise from the dead to slay them. This conversation isn't out of the blue though, as our father begins warning us of unrest in Rome, before our visit is cut short by a barbarian attack. This attack takes us through the streets of Rome, but results in the death of both of Marius' parents and sister. As our father is slain by barbarians, we meet Commander Vitalian a friend of our father, and due to Marius' bloodlust and quest for revenge, he transfers Marius into his 15th legion, promising Marius with his legion, his vengeance will be enacted. With the 15th legion, we head to Britain, where we receive reports of a rebellion at York, which is where the barbarian King Oswald and his daughter Boudicca are. So we head north to aid the defeated legion stationed there and manage to capture both the king and his daughter. We bring our captors to the emperor's son Basilius who reveals his brother Commodus has been captured by the barbarians but his whereabouts is unknown. To get his brother's whereabouts, Basilius threatens King Oswald with killing his daughter in front of him which quickly gets Oswald to talk and Commodus is revealed to have been traded to the fearsome men north of Hadrian's Wall, outside of Rome's reach in Britannia. Now with Commodus' location, Basilius orders Vitalian, Marius and the 15th Legion to retrieve him, which goes south very quickly upon arriving. Mythical beasts attack in the shape of minotaurs, they're just barbarians in costume 
and Vitalian is captured and Marius is separated from the rest of his legion. Marius makes his way through the enemy camp, freeing his captured Roman soldiers along the way. Marius kills the barbarian leader Glot and rescues both Vitalian and Commodus, which he is eternally grateful for. Well, don't just stand there, you useless souls! Get me out of here! Get me out of here, you stupid fools! I command you! With Commodus returned safely, a peace treaty between the Romans and the Barbarians is in the works, but Commodus lets his anger go to his head and whilst embracing King Oswald, stabs him in the back, causing the Barbarians to attack. Commodus and his advisors flee and leave Marius and the 15th Legion to defend York whilst they escape. Amidst the chaos of the Barbarian Uprising, Marius realises that the band of barbarians he encountered years ago that invaded Rome and killed his family was all caused by Nero in order to eliminate his father as a political rival. The barbarians are now led by Boudicca, and in order to give the Romans enough time to escape, Marius sacrifices himself to buy extra time. Marius is revived by the goddess of summer though, as she gives Marius the mantle of Damocles, and to avenge Marius' family, fallen comrades, and save Rome, Marius must kill the emperors and his sons. Marius, now wearing the Black Centurion's armor, takes advantage of Emperor Nero and his son's interest in gladiator sports, and so enters himself into the event known as Ludi. Marius displays his combat skills in front of Basilius to gain him entry into the event, and whilst having a private meeting with Basilius, Marius is able to slay him in secrecy. Before we head to the main gladiator event though, an oracle informs Marius that Nero can only be killed by his own sword, at least if we intend not to anger the gods. Once in the Colosseum and emerging victorious, we face off with Commodus as he shows his cowardice in battle with cheap tricks, but he is ultimately unsuccessful and slain by Marius. Nero and Damocles call for each other's head, but not here. Marius escapes and finally heads back home. Once in Rome, Marius meets up with Vitalian, who explains that Boudicca is gathering enough barbarian tribes to storm Rome itself, and whilst Vitalian agrees Nero must die, Rome must also be saved. We manage to slay countless barbarians, but Vitalian is ultimately slain by Boudicca during battle, and so Marius takes up command of the 15th Legion and kills Boudicca, despite acknowledging that Nero has caused each other to become enemies. Now we're back to the game's beginning, or present day. The mysterious sack we now know to contain Boudicca's head, and we escort Nero to his safe room. Nero has realised that Marius is Damocles, and he's locked himself in a room with the very person he has been worried about, and so he flees. Whilst pursuing Nero, Marius is distracted once the god of the north wind appears and reveals he has been aiding Nero this whole time, and it's all because he wants to see Rome collapse. Whilst Marius is distracted by the god, he is severely wounded by Nero and his guards who are waiting in the shadows for the ambush. Pushing through his impending death though, Marius tackles Nero off a balcony which leaves Nero to fall on his statue's sword, which fulfills the prophecy, but Marius falls to the ground and dies from his wounds. The game ends with the barbarian invasion failing after the loss of Boudicca. Rome has not fallen, and Marius now hailed as the hero who fended them off. And that's the story for Rise, Son of Rome. I'll be honest, I didn't remember too much about the story for Rise before I began this retrospective, but I really did enjoy it this time around. It's not a complex story or anything new, I mean, it's a story about revenge and enemies not being as obvious as they seem, but it's enjoyable and I found myself hooked almost immediately. 
In regards to the actual story, I was captivated every time Marius opened his mouth due to the excellent performance given by John Hopkins. He just makes everything Marius says feel important, and whether he is giving an inspiring speech to the troops, or overridden with anger, it all helps you want to get stuck right into the gameplay and slay anything in your path, which for a hack and slasher is a pretty good quality. I also love the story's presentation from chapter to chapter, being presented through the stone story walls as it lends to the feeling of someone discovering this story. Which leads me onto the real history surrounding Rise Son of Rome's story. I will admit my fondness for the story may expose my own bias and love for history as I've stated, but despite Rise's story not going for historical accuracy, that doesn't mean Crytek didn't care about the history of Rome. If you were to look up any number of characters, locations, gods, even phrases and stories, you're more than likely going to find some information about the history of Rome. Now, these characters and events may not coincide as they do in Rise, some actually being centuries apart, but for someone like myself who loves learning more and more about history, it really doesn't take much to pique my interest, and comparing characters and events in history to in-game is something I find a lot of joy in. And in the case of Rise, when you learn about the history, the decisions in-game make a lot of sense. For instance, Emperor Nero was the fifth Roman Emperor during the Imperial period, whose rule lasted for almost 14 years between the years 54 and 68 AD, taking the role of emperor at age 16, and as recorded by people of the time, was thought to be quite an impulsive and corrupt leader. Nero's timeline does also coincide with the Celtic barbarian uprising against Rome, led by their queen, Boudicca, at around 60-61 AD. But this revolt in Britannia, or Britain, was not stopped by Marius, as he seems to be a work of fiction from my research, but instead by Nero's general, Suetonius Paulinus. Nero was believed to have also taken his own life, but this has not been proven. And whilst Nero did not have any sons in reality, and again, I cannot seem to find a Basilius in my research, Commodus was in fact a Roman Emperor also, just a hundred years after Nero, and someone who was regarded as an Emperor who took a more dictatorship-like role, but also due to his godlike ego, did perform as a gladiator in the Colosseum. The Hadrian Wall was a Roman defence fortification in the Romans' province in Britannia, and past this wall was unconquered territory held by barbarians. I mean, the list goes on. There is plenty more history I could go over to show Crytek's love for the time period, but I think you get the point. The story itself is a work of fiction, but when you learn about the history that inspired this story, a lot of decisions that were made make so much sense and show a level of care that I think goes unnoticed in this game. I honestly don't have too much else to say about the actual story. I don't believe it's a work of art or a contender for best story or anything like that, but I was engaged from start to finish. John Hopkins as Marius absolutely kills it. The care for history is present, and for me, the story just needed to have some intriguing history surrounding it and make me want to be a badass Roman soldier and fight to save Rome, which it does. I mean, look, it's not a story that's going to blow you away, but it's a good time. The gameplay for Rise Son of Rome is a surprisingly tricky aspect for me to discuss, and that's because while I was playing the game, I did have a really enjoyable time. But now that I'm writing this retrospective, it's honestly hard to justify why. Now I'm bringing this up in the beginning because I know by the time I get done with this segment, it is going to seem like I didn't like the gameplay. But you're just going to have to remember, I did enjoy it, for reasons I will explain 
but there is some glaring issues. But let's dive into the mechanics. Rise is a third person hack and slasher and it plays a lot like the Arkham series with the focus being getting into a flow in combat, going from enemy to enemy, avoiding getting hit, countering, attacking whilst a nice combo develops. The difference between Arkham and Rise though is there isn't the different combos or gadgets here. You have a sword and shield, no real combos, just the need to mix up your sword and shield attacks to deal damage and stun the enemies, and weaken them down enough to perform executions. I do love the executions. They're brutal and they make you feel pretty damn awesome, I must say, with a good amount of variety depending on the enemy, any environmental hazards, and where you begin the execution. But that's really if the combat took us just a paragraph to explain, so I'm sure you can see an issue here. The combat just doesn't have enough meat on the bones. It's a lot of fun when you begin the game. The sword and shield have a good feeling of power about them. Mixing in the attacks, dodging and parrying feels good to build up your hit combo and executions again feel great to watch but it becomes repetitious very quickly with no new tools to add to your belt and just relying on the few new enemies as you progress to try and mix up the combat. You do get projectiles from time to time in the pilers, but mixing these in with normal combat never seemed to work consistently, so you just end up going back to your sword and shield. Now the gameplay does mix it up with the Scorpios and Roman formation segments, but again, they just don't change in between one another. The Scorpios are just turret segments with auto locking and the formations which I am admittedly more fond of because I love the perspective, but it's just walking and shielding up until you reach the arches to throw your spears at. Again, these initially do act as a good break between combat and mixing the gameplay up. But they don't evolve, and instead of being cool moments, they can turn to more ugh moments. I think my biggest issue with the gameplay though, is it's clear that the game's development and change in directions left the game feeling bare bones, because to me, the easy fix to offset the repetition would have been to change the XP system. The XP and leveling system in Rise is effectively worthless. You can purchase passive upgrades like health or increased bonuses for your executions, but they usually tie back into getting more XP or something. And using this system, again, it just doesn't feel like it matters. What these upgrades could have been, I mean, think of anything. Different combos, more unique executions, other melee or ranged weapons, easier counters for more fiddly enemies. If these were the upgrades, you could still have more health or whatever else this system has, but it would then benefit the combat as well and make getting high combos or try getting maximum XP per encounter feel worthwhile. They could have also improved the executions to make them feel more tense because to my knowledge, despite them being quick time events, as long as you press A button, you cannot fail them. You'll just get more or less XP depending on how well you did, which as I've explained, doesn't matter. I just think they shot themselves in the foot with changing perspectives and whether or not this would be a Kinect game and didn't leave themselves enough time to fully flesh out the gameplay because I do see the potential. I mean, I compared it to Arkham after all and you should know my feelings on that series by now. As I said in the beginning of this segment though, I did have a good time playing Rise, but how? Well, it's really for two main reasons, and the first being the constant change of environments. Despite performing the same acts over and over again, Rise's levels change each chapter, and just having something visually different to look at can help ease that feeling of repetition. Plus, I know I don't talk about visuals in these retrospectives because I don't go back to games expecting visual masterpieces, but I mean, come on, Rise is beautiful and the environments are so gorgeous to look at and varied 
that it makes you want to hunt for the relatively meaningless collectibles just to explore and see every nook and cranny of the level, which also helps break up the constant combat. But the second reason I enjoyed playing the game so much despite its problems is because I can just acknowledge this is a turn your brain off sort of game. I love a challenge, I love games that make me think or put me on the edge of my seat, I really do. But I don't always want that. Sometimes I just like to sit back, relax and smash buttons and have it appease that caveman part of my brain. I have no problem stating this game's problems and at release, at full price, yeah it would be easy to see how these issues could be too much. But now it's on Xbox Game Pass or even if you buy it, it's cheap as chips. And to just know I can sit down and immerse myself in this time period as I slay thousands of barbarians, I mean, it's enjoyable. Or at least, I enjoyed that for a change. Hold up, before I get to the conclusion, I'm sure some of you are wondering, what about the multiplayer co-op mode? Not going to talk about that? Here's the thing with that. I was all set after I finished the campaign. I enjoyed myself, had some fun, but I was ready to put the controller down after and move on to other games, so no, no multiplayer discussion in this video, I'm sorry. This retrospective may have surprised you. I know this opinion may not be popular opinion, but I really did enjoy revisiting Rise Son of Rome. I can accept that my own intrigue and interest in history may blind me or bias me towards many aspects of this game such as the story, but I can't help that. I like what I like. It is just another story of revenge. The gameplay is repetitious, there is no dancing around that. But for me, Rise is a short experience of 4-5 to five hours where I get to be transported to a period in history I am interested in, and just to have a bit of fun. As I said, I understand the criticisms especially at launch and being a fully priced game. But now for a few bucks or through Game Pass, if you can accept that you probably won't need your brain for this one, I do think you'll have a bit of fun. But I do believe if you're not someone who is particularly interested or intrigued by the history, the issues of Rise may be too much to look past. Personally, I would love to see Crytek make a sequel and from the ground up build the game now knowing what it is and fleshing it out a lot more because I do think there is something here that could be something great. But considering they weren't stoked at the sales from this game, I doubt we'll ever see it. Or at least, not anytime soon. Thank you all so much for watching. I just wanted to pop in here at the end quickly to apologise for the two month hiatus. It wasn't planned or a case of fatigue or lack of motivation, but more so that where I live finally left lockdown after almost six months and I just needed to catch up with everyone. But I've reintroduced myself to society now and I'm ready to get stuck back into making some videos because I really have missed it. That's all I really have to say for now. Again, thank you for watching and your continued support. And now, I best get started on that 2K special. So, I'll see you all then and have a good one.